The weathering processes that you just learned about produce the raw materials for sedimentary rocks. So whether we have weathering of igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary rocks, weathering produces sediment. Sediment can then be compacted and cemented into sedimentary rocks, which is our next sort of mini lecture discussion. Sediment becomes rock in a few steps. The first of those steps that includes all changes that occur after sediment is deposited is called diagenesis. So this little symbol here, this lowercase delta means change. Some of the changes that can occur after sediment is deposited includes recrystallization of unstable minerals. So this can include, your textbook actually talks about a variety of calcium carbonate called aragonite that over time will recrystallize into calcite. They have the same chemical formula, but their crystal structure is a little bit different, and so they're called different minerals. But recrystallization is the process, for in that situation, of aragonite recrystallizing into calcite um, because it is more stable at the surface of the earth. Once most minerals are stabilized, the next process that occurs is called lithification. And that is the actual process of creating rock. This word here, lith, this word part, lith means rock. Lithification is literally the creation of rock, turning sediment into rock. The process of lithification is collectively compaction of part particles and then cementation of them together, which is illustrated in this diagram. So this diagram shows you a series of sediments that are deposited. You can see the gray is the quartz. You can see there's no label on the white mineral and you see some feldspars and then you see pore spaces and that's the space between the particles. Over time, material get deposited on top of that and that's called the overburden. This could be as simple as you walking through a park and your feet squishing down the sediment beneath your feet. Um, so what you see here is during compaction, the pore spaces between particles is reduced. Then finally, water will move through the sediment. That water will be carrying with it dissolved minerals. When dissolved minerals move into locations that have lower pressure, which you have as you get closer to the surface of the earth, those dissolved minerals will precipitate and they will become cement. You can see the cement further reduces the pore spaces between particles, but it also then cements the particles together. There are three typical cements for most sedimentary rocks. There's quartz, which you identify simply because it's harder than glass. There is calcite. Calcite you identify, of course, because it reacts to hydrochloric acid or any acid, really. And then there is um, iron oxide cement and iron oxide cement you can identify because the rock will appear red in color. When iron becomes oxidized, like you learned in weathering, it turns red. So those are the three types of cements that are involved in the lithification process. Sedimentary rocks have two main textures based on the source of the sediment. And in this mini lecture, we're going to learn exclusively about clastic rocks. Clastic rocks, your textbook also calls detrital rocks. Clastic rocks are fragments of pre-existing rock that get cemented together. Often those particles have been transported from their original source area. They are named by, based, clastic sedimentary rocks are named based on their size of their particles, the shape of the particles, and how well sorted the particles are. So with that, we're going to talk about a little bit about rounding and sorting of particles. The source of most sediment in sedimentary rocks is ultimately the weathering of mountains. So as particles are tr break off of mountains, either through weathering processes or through mass wasting events like landslides, the particles that are closest to the source area or closest to the mountains are typically angular in shape. So if we look at the particles, they have jagged edges and they're irregularly shaped. However, as those particles become transported by rivers, by water, and by wind, over time, a lot of these angular particles will become more rounded, first sub-angular, then sub-rounded, and then finally rounded. And that's due to bouncing of particles along the bottom of river valleys, or um, again, bouncing along the bottom as they're transported by wind. But regardless, over time, particles tend to become more rounded as they travel further away from the source area that is typically the mountains. Sorting refers to how particles are relative to one another in size. So a poorly sorted sample 
is one that has a variety of grain sizes, which you see here in this diagram. So there's particles that are large, medium, and then fine grained, all kind of mishmashed together. And that's again, very typical of like a landslide deposit or something very close to the source area. Then as those particles are picked up and carried by water, wind, and ice, those larger particles will break down into smaller pieces. And as you look in general, the larger particles become smaller over time and they break into particles of about the same size. So once the particles are about the same size, we say that they are well sorted. Um, and when there are a variety of sizes, we say they're poorly sorted. In general, as you move further from away from the source area, which again is, is mountains, the sediment will become more well-rounded and more well-sorted. The other thing that will happen is that a lot of the par uh, minerals that are unstable at the surface of the earth will become more stable as they're transported away because they will sort of begin to chemically weather into minerals that are stable. So I thought that kind of a cool way to do this would be to start at a source area and see how these particles change as you move away. So I started here at the source area, which are the Grand Teton Mountains in Wyoming. Um, and the Grand Tetons are this beautiful mountain range that kind of rise up out of the earth. They are located just south of Yellowstone National Park. So here's Wyoming. This very large park up here is Yellowstone, and it's connected to the Grand Teton National Park by the very narrow John D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway. The cool part of that story is that John D. Rockefeller actually purchased the land and donated it to the Park Service so that the bison and elk in the area could have a place to free, freely migrate from Yellowstone in the summer down to the Tetons. I'm sorry, the Tetons in the summer. Oh, I'm lying. Let's just cross out. He donated the land so that elk and bison could migrate in the summer up to Yellowstone, which is at a higher elevation, and in the winter down to the Tetons so that they could um, sort of enjoy warmer weather down there. And this hike begins along the Tetons. And this is a pile of rocks basically at the base of the Tetons. This is called a talus slope. And if you look at the particles in this talus slope, you can see particles that are very characteristic of those that are um, very, that have experienced very little weathering. So you can see the particles are a variety of grain sizes. You can see that they're largely um, very angular in shape. So these particles are perfectly adapted, actually the marmots that live in these particles really are perfectly adapted to live in a talus slope. Uh, marmots are these cute little rodents that kind of make adorable little squeaking noises and they themselves are so fluffy but they won't let you hug them um, in case you're wondering my students have tried many times uh, but these marmots live on talus slopes because they have these great little claws where they can scramble around. Um, so the particles these talus slopes that are angular and poorly sorted are the same particles that we see in the sedimentary rock breccia. So you should have seen that in your lab this week. Breccia is composed of poorly sorted particles that are cemented together and they're also angular in shape. So if you look at the actual particles in these grains, um, you can see that they have very sharp edges. They are also um, a variety of grain sizes. So that's fun. Um, so in the future, geologists of the future will be able to look at the breccia in this location and determine that it was a talus slope based on the rocks that we find there. If we move a little further downstream, a little bit away from the Tetons, we come upon this creek called Jenny Creek, which is also in Grand Teton National Park. And it flows into this place called Jenny Lake, which is at the base of the Tetons. Here is a very short video um, that illustrates what Jenny Creek is like. So that was from a trip that my students took um, when we taught geology of the uh, field studies in geology a few years ago. Um, and we went to the Tetons and Yellowstone and Craters of the Moon and Devil's Tower. So if you look at the particles in Jenny Creek, you can see that they're a little bit more rounded than the particles that we saw in the talus slope. But you can also see that there's still a variety of sizes and you can't even see here all the particles that are moving in this fast moving water. So here we have particles that are more rounded but poorly sorted. In the future, that will turn into this rock, which in your lab you learned 
is a conglomerate. So conglomerate is a rock that we can pick up today and interpret used to be a river in the past. And remember, that's uniformitarianism. The idea that by studying the present, we can better unravel secrets of the past. By seeing what particles are deposited in rivers today, we can figure out how past environments used to be on the earth. If we were to travel a little bit further down slope, so the, these bigger particles broke into smaller and smaller particles, but we're still like medium sized particles, we would find this rock, which you can see is still poorly sorted, but is, uh, and is now red um, because there's been some oxidation of the iron, but nevertheless, the particles are smaller in size. And you should hopefully recognize from your lab that this is actually called Arcos. You're going to a little practice with these rocks in just a bit um, in your next activity. So that's exciting. If we were in a completely different environment though, like here, um, we would get a slightly different rock. So this, these are the Italian Alps and I'm actually, my feet are in the Mediterranean Sea and I took a picture of the source area. So I took a picture of the source area because this is a situation where these volcanic rocks are transported not very far before they are dumped into the ocean. And the type of rock that you would get is still medium in grain size because the Mediterranean Sea is smashing onto the, um, the beach here at a pretty, uh, pretty high energy. Um, but a lot of those particles haven't really weathered very much in between the Alps and the beach. The rock that would form there is called gray wacky. So gray wacky is often called a dirty sandstone. You find them offshore very close to volcanoes and close to the source area because a lot of the particles have not had an opportunity really to weather out just yet. So that's cool. Um, and then if we were to move further away, like let's say the beach was another 100 miles away, we would end up looking at this rock. So this is quartz sandstone. And you can see that this is a very well sorted rock. The particles are well rounded. You would identify that under a microscope, but this kind of even looks like the beach. Quartz sandstone is a rock that can be found not just at the beach, but in any high energy environment where it's been transported a good distance from the, uh, from the source area. But the fi it's fast enough moving that those fine grain particles like silt and clay, like the water is just moving too fast for those particles to settle down at all. So those particles get carried further down shore and into the lower energy environments. So this is going to be a high energy environment because all of the fine grain particles are lost here. We can find these at beaches. We can find like this one, which looks absolutely nothing like Rochester today or really ever. <laughs> um, but this sort of white sand beach that you see here is characteristic of quartz sand. Um, and that's pretty great. Um, so you can also find quartz sandstone in the channel of what's called a delta. A delta is a landform that forms when you have a fast moving river move into like a slower moving body of water. So what happens is that it starts to dump all of its bigger sediment as soon as it hits that um, slower moving part body of water and then the really fine grain stuff gets carried further away. When the energy is lower, the water will no longer even be able to, uh, to carry the finer grain particles and they'll get dumped. So you can find uh, quartz sandstone here. So this is what's called the channel of the delta. Here's where the river is flowing into this body of water. The water's still moving pretty fast right through here, but then that water starts to swirl out into these areas. This is called the bay of the delta, and this is where the water is moving much, much slower. Um, and so you won't get quartz sandstone there, but you will get it towards the faster moving parts. You can also find quartz sandstone in sand dunes. Um, so this is a continuation of a story that we talked about in weathering where Barone and I found um, some caves that we were pretty sure were occupied by mountain lions. So I mentioned that we initially pulled off in this area because there were petroglyphs. And here are the, some of the petroglyphs, that's her hand, um, pointing to one of the petroglyphs of an antelope that lived in the area. And while we were driving around this area, off in the distance, we saw this area, which is called Boar's Tusk. So, um, yeah, you should know what this is. Do you know? This is a feature. This is a volcanic feature. Actually, it's a plutonic feature. 
This is called a boar's tusk and it's a volcanic neck. So that means there used to be a volcano in this whole area, but the volcano largely eroded away. You can still see some of it here, but this is the pipe where the magma chamber in the subsurface used to come up to the surface. Then it became geologically dead and has slowly been eroded away. The rock in the center of this pipe is a little bit more resistant to weathering. So that's why it's still sticking up. So we're like, oh my God, that's so cool. Let's go see a volcanic neck. And if you can see in the background here, there is a field of migrating sand dunes that are called the Killpecker sand dunes in Wyoming. So Barone was driving and I was navigating and I found this very straight road that I thought was going to end up at Boar's Tusk, but I was wrong. Here's a picture of that road. We were riding, I believe in a Toyota Camry, which is not field worthy in case you were wondering. And um, she looked at me and said, I feel like we are driving at the bottom of an aquarium. And I looked at a very old map and I realized that we were actually driving on an old rail line. And that rail line was never, ever going to go to um, <laughs> Boar's Tusk. But as we got closer, we saw another trail that seemed to go towards the sand dunes. So we decided to take it. And we did. And it didn't end well. So as we got closer to Boar's Tusk, we came upon this situation and um, it was a tiny little bit of a sand dune that had migrated in the road. And you can see here that there's sort of like a hard pack road here. This area was really for like off-road vehicles, but um, yeah, the Toyota Camry did not really uh, work here. So I remember Barone paused and looked at me and she said, do you think we can make it? And I said, yeah, it doesn't look really that deep. And it wasn't. Um, and guess what? I was wrong again. So you can see the tire tracks and this is exactly how far the Toyota Camry made it in a couple inches of sand and um, we sunk and sunk and then the wheels just started spinning and uh, Barone looked at me and I looked at her and uh, she floored it like she just hit the gas and we went precisely nowhere and um, so I'm from Buffalo New York and if there's one thing girls from Buffalo are all taught to do it's to get yourself out of snow um, so I looked at her and I said stop 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 what you're doing um, and we had this moment of panic because we looked at each other and we realized that we had about an inch of water in bottles between us we had no cell reception and we had actually changed our route that morning and absolutely knew no one knew where we were were. So that was um, stupid, <laughs> it turns out. Um, and I saw the panic in her eyes and I said to her, look, do you know how to rock it? And she looked at me with a, and, and said, I, I can rock it and started dancing. I'm like, no, no, no. Do you know how to like rock a car out of a snowbank where you kind of put it in forward and then reverse and you just like give it just a touch of gas. And, and she was like, uh, I can figure it out. I can figure it out. And so, um, I got out of the car and it took us probably 15 or 20 minutes, but we finally got the Camry moving and, and you can, it turns out, get a Camry out of a sand dune pretty much the same way you can get it out of a snowbank. So there's a life lesson for you. Um, when we got the Camry out of the sand dune, I looked at her and we got out of the car. She got out of the car because I was already out of the car. And uh, we realized how incredibly stupid and dangerous we just did was. And um, we cried for, for like a second and said, we're never bringing students here. And we never have. Um, here is the sand dune that was adjacent to our car. And you can see the really sweet ripple marks in the sand dunes here. Um, and one of the next things that my eyes kind of focused on after we had this moment of celebration where we realized we weren't going to die most likely um and then we saw these footprints in the sand dunes that we later confirmed were actually mountain lion footprints so that i like to tell my kids is the day i almost got eaten by a mountain lion uh but didn't so that's sweet all right so our last clastic sedimentary rock the one that is furthest from the source area is called shale and so here you can see in this shale um, the imprint of a fern fossil you can see the thin little layers of mud um, and that's because shale is basically composed of clay clay only will settle in water that is pretty much completely stagnant and um, it it basically, you have very slow accumulation of mud in waters like swamps and lagoons and, and deep ocean basins. So 
Um, in just a sec, I'm going to pull up Google Earth and I will show you what a lagoon is. So when I uh, was a young geology student, I also um, learned that this shale was formed in lagoons and had no actual idea what a lagoon was, but I memorized it like a good student. Um, and then I moved to North Carolina. I went to grad school in Chapel Hill at UNC. And um, Chapel Hill has a big water, like an ocean research area in Wilmington. And so that is where I actually learned uh, what a lagoon really was. So this is North Carolina and um, these chain of very narrow barrier islands that you can see here outlined in yellow. Those are called the Outer Banks. Lots of people go there on vacation. And um, this is actually the lagoon. So here's mainland North Carolina and here is the barrier islands. The lagoon is the area in between the barrier islands and the mainland. And you can see that in some locations, the barrier islands get very close to the mainland um, and the lagoon is very narrow. So that's what I'm going to actually show you here. Um, this is a picture from the mainland of North Carolina looking toward these very expensive houses on um, one of the outer banks. And you can see that the water is very quiet. Uh, that's because the barrier island absorbs most of the energy from waves um, from the ocean. And uh, yeah, you just have quiet water here where mud very gently settles out. Other places that you can also have mud very gently settle out is in swamps. This is a picture that I took on a bayou tour in uh, Louisiana. And um, you can see that this is another really low energy environment, really muddy water. Um, and we were lucky enough to see just one alligator uh, because it was kind of cold this time of year. But um, what's really cool to me are these cypress trees. So the Spanish moss live on cypress trees. Cypress trees are adapted to live in with their uh, root systems in salt water, which is really unique. Most wood rots in water, but cypress is adapted to just survive very well in water and not in fact decompose even when submerged. So there was a time in US history after the Civil War called the Reconstruction Period when the North very heavily taxed the South and uh, part of that tax was based on the wealth of the people in the South. And so there are really crazy stories of people in Louisiana cutting down these cypress trees and having them fall in the water in the bayou. And that water uh, basically preserved the cypress trees. Like you can actually still pull up cypress trees from um, the Civil War era. They just haven't rotted. Um, and so they did that to hide how much their land was actually worth because cypress trees were a source of income for people at that time. It's crazy. Um, yeah. So those are your classic sedimentary rocks.